Our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Peter Quaides, who's going to talk on managing menorrhagia and chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia. Dr. Quaides is the medical and research director at the Mary Gooley Hemophilia Treatment Center and at the University of Rochester School of Medicine in Rochester, New York. I should tell you, when I first met Peter years ago, and Peter may not remember this, he talked about women and bleeding disorder as the silent majority, and I was very impressed by that. It kind of stuck in my mind. And I'm hoping with this conference and similar conferences, we will change that silent into an outspoken majority. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, Roshi, and I'd uh, also like to thank uh, Andy um, and the rest of the organizers uh, for inviting me to participate in this uh, symposium. It's uh, nice to be here among uh, friends as well as colleagues, collaborators. And um, uh, I think, uh, as has already been mentioned, this is a good start to the meeting to uh, focus on this uh, issue that's uh, clearly one uh, need of uh, further attention in uh, research in that sense. Um, today, I'm uh, going to, I've been asked to focus uh, not specifically on uh, uh, bleeding uh, disorders uh, per se, but in terms of uh, managing the patient uh, who becomes thrombocytopenic or is thrombocytopenic perhaps uh, uh, prior uh, to chemotherapy and, uh, and develops uh, in turn heavy menstrual uh, bleeding. Now, I'd like to tell my uh, residents uh, and fellows that we're all creatures of our last case. Uh, if that's the case, I'm a very old creature because this is a uh, case we uh, published about uh, seven years ago in the American Journal of uh, Hematology of a very challenging case. And uh, for better for us, it often uh, uh, reminds us that sometimes in uh, medicine, uh, the kitchen sink approach is uh, what applies. So this is a, uh, a patient who's diagnosed with uh, AML. And uh, she didn't have any prior history of uh, heavy menstrual bleeding. And I uh, actually just want to uh, editorialize quickly that uh, the latest nomenclature now is to replace menorrhagia for heavy menstrual bleeding. But uh, at the time of uh, uh, putting this symposium together, we used the term menorrhagia. But I think now for most uh, uh, publications, uh, there's HMB is the, uh, the present uh, 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 referral of, uh, heavy, of uh, menorrhagia. Uh, in that uh, uh, regard. But anyway, in this case, uh, this patient was treated in standard uh, fashion. And uh, then uh, she uh, started developing uh, not only GI bleeding, but actually uh, uterine bleeding became uh, uh, quite prominent. Uh, she was having uh, dark stools, but it was really the menstrual flow that uh, she needed to change about every uh, 30 minutes, uh, uh, her uh, uh, protection. And uh, this uh, continued, not surprisingly, this was in the setting of uh, the uh, chemotherapy myelosuppressing her markedly at that time. And unfortunately, as we see in our particular female patients, up to 10 to 20 percent uh, become alloimmunized, which she did uh, quite uh, quickly uh, over this uh, period of time. And uh, she was really bleeding, uh, bleeding uh, briskly, uh, essentially using our massive uh, transfusion uh, protocol. And, um, you know, uh, for better or for worse, we will, you know, go to HLA match platelets. As you know, those matches are perfect matches that uh, even that strategy often uh, isn't successful in, uh, you know, raising uh, the platelet count. And uh, as uh, Jennifer had uh, mentioned, uh, you know, IV estrogens is certainly an option. Uh, she was at that time given a total of 50 milligrams a day, but as Jennifer pointed out, uh, nowadays you can manage uh, probably 25 milligrams uh, QID in that uh, regard. And essentially she was receiving a gram of, uh, amino, uh, uh, epsilon, of epsilon amino caproic acid uh, every hour. Uh, probably nowadays with uh, the availability of uh, tranexamic acids, also available IV, uh, you could uh, use it uh, intravenously because it is probably about four to five times more potent, as you know, uh, than uh, Amicar, uh, you know, in that sense. And again, not surprisingly, the platelet transfusions, uh, you know, uh, did not really budge. 
and make any difference. And then not surprisingly in this type of scenario, if you're a hematologist with uh, gray hairs like myself, uh, you are going to have cases like this where desperate measures uh, require, desperate situations require desperate measures. And maybe to treat ourselves, maybe because back then it was uh, a trendy uh, thing to do when someone was uh, really uh, uh, bleeding out and point of uh, exsanguinating to death, uh, Novo 7, uh, Recombinant 7A becomes, you know, part of uh, the uh, routine. Uh, though I'll make a point that with her platelets so low, uh, there probably were not enough platelets to generate a throb and burr. So it didn't seem theoretically uh, that, you know, that would help. And I'll uh, touch upon that later about when you would think of giving 7A, uh, probably only in very select instances, probably more when someone has thrombocytopathic bleeding in terms of uh, pre-existing Glanzmann's or Bernard Soulier's, not so much uh, in someone who's truly thrombocytopenic, and yet we did it uh, just uh, as, uh, as a hopeful uh, measure uh, uh, given uh, you know, the severity uh, of, uh, of the uh, situation. Um, because, uh, again, she continued to bleed, and um, the, uh, uh, the gynecology team uh, did pack her uterus. Uh, there's, uh, I'm not sure at that time whether a balloon uh, procedure was also included, but uh, uh, she ended up uh, having uh, her uterus uh, uh, packed, and my colleague, uh, Razan Kadir, uh, in uh, Royal Free in London, uh, typically will uh, uh, drench that with... Um, uh, Tranxamic acid IV. Um, again, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how uh, standardized that is, but uh, again, sometimes in a desperate situation, you know, that is an option. And she continued to have uh, very brisk uh, bleeding, and um, ultimately, uh, the, um, uh, radi the interventional radiology team um, uh, came through in terms of a uterine uh, artery embolization. And uh, that was uh, done uh, using pyvinyl alcohol and uh, the gelatin uh, sponge. And uh, at that point, the bleeding uh, did stop. And uh, you can see the image on the left where they, you know, pre-embolization, uh, they visualize the uh, branch of the uterine artery. And then you can see uh, its absence, uh, you know, thereafter, um, you know, on the uh, right. So uh, this uh, case obviously is... Uh, um, just informative in the sense that uh, reminds us that uh, the bleeding can clearly be life-threatening and uh, uh, there's a number of options that can be tried, but uh, often they're not going to uh, necessarily, you know, be effective uh, in that uh, regard. And uh, in this case, at least, there was a role for uh, uterine artery uh, embolization. As a starting point uh, uh, for this uh, uh, talk, um, Oh, and I'm sorry, I just remissed, uh, I should uh, add in follow-up about this case. After uh, she had the embolization uh, here, she uh, then subsequently um, uh, had, uh, she, you know, recovered, she stopped bleeding, and uh, then uh, thereafter uh, she um, uh, was going to receive uh, further treatment because the good part of all this, of course, is that she did enter a, a remission induction. Uh, but uh, then, obviously, as a standard care, would receive consolidation chemotherapy. And uh, prior to that, it was decided uh, uh, to, you know, do an endometrial ablation. And then thereafter, she uh, did well without any, uh, you know, uh, recurrent uh, uterine uh, hemorrhage in that regard. So we are going to, uh, for this session, primarily focus on acquired uh, uh, platelet disorders in terms of chemotherapy induced, in terms of managing such a patient. Uh, but we'll also touch a little bit upon uh, some other platelet disorders, not technically thrombocytopenic, but thrombocytopathic bleeding, uh, thrombocytopathic disorders that can be associated with uh, acute menstrual bleeding in terms of uh, Bernard Soulier and Glanzmann's and storage pool disease, or just the patient uh, that uh, Dr. Phillip has uh, well described with uh, menorrhagia, who has about a 50 to 70 percent chance of having uh, some degree of a platelet uh, aggregation uh, abnormality, and uh, how we should manage uh, such a patient also. Uh, but obviously, the acquired disorders, uh, the audience quite knows quite well, besides chemotherapy-induced, um, uh, thrombocytopenia would also include uh, ITP, and uh, believe it or not, uh, there is uh, some data, and I have uh, seen a few cases uh, over two decades of, uh, of uh, thrombocytopenia actually being uh, um, 
associated uh, with iron deficiency, which seems so counterintuitive because we uh, always talk about uh, reactive thrombocytosis uh, being commonly caused by iron deficiency. And yet Brass and others have reported uh, a few cases of patients uh, who can present uh, when in the throes of being extremely iron deficient with actually uh, thrombocytopenia as low as 20 to 30,000. Uh, with the proof of the connection being that upon iron repletion, their platelet count uh, increases. And I know, again, that's counterintuitive. It's always in our differential in someone who has reactive thrombocytosis to first rule out iron deficiency before the costly uh, JAK2 test or anything else. Uh, and yet, uh, there seems to be uh, some select uh, cases. And I've been convinced uh, uh, this, again, is not uh, EBM evidence-based medicine. It's more ABM anecdotal-based medicine. But uh, I'm convinced uh, with a, a handful of cases over 20 years, uh, I can recall vividly at least two women with very large fibroids who uh, presented uh, you know, with menorrhagia and their platelets were uh, below 50,000 uh, and they had severe iron deficiency anemia and upon correction of the iron, uh, the uh, platelet, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but uh, it's you know, usually in the other direction, uh, of course. Um, but, um, uh, and also, of course, with thrombocytopathic uh, bleeding in the uh, uh, right-hand column at the bottom there, um, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, patients often are on non -steroidals. It's often a catch-22 because the heavy menstrual flow is also, you know, leading to uh, uh, menstrual cramping. And uh, they will, uh, you know, take a lot of non -steroidals, and so they can have that vicious cycle. On the other hand, uh, is uh, in the past there's been ACOG bulletins that have pointed out that uh, there is some benefit with non in some patients with menorrhagia, and obviously that would be sacrilege uh, here when I'm, when I'm preaching to the choir about we would never want our patients to take non who have an underlying bleeding disorder, but if they don't, uh, because there is, uh, as part of the mechanism in some cases, of, um, of heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, prostaglandins uh, playing a role. Uh, sometimes non do, do you know, does reduce that. But when we see someone who has underlying bleeding disorders, Roshni had recently uh, emailed us a case as she saw of someone who uh, adolescent presented with heavy menstrual bleeding, and because she was having cramping, was taking non around the clock. That obviously did magnify her uh, menstrual bleeding, uh, you know, in, in that uh, regard. In terms of how common uh, thrombocytopenic bleeding is in this setting, it's not very common. We can go back to the literature, which have uh, often uh, just uh, looked at uh, the underlying uh, hematologic disorders that could be associated with menorrhagia to see that in all of these series, uh, there is a, uh, a, a proportion of patients uh, who have uh, either ITP or a platelet function uh, uh, defect uh, as a cause. Many of these studies are older studies where they weren't uh, uh, doing uh, exhaustive, uh, uh, comprehensive platelet aggregation um, uh, assessment. And uh, you can see uh, in a study from Canada uh, over two decades ago, about two decades ago, there was a proportion who had uh, some type of platelet disorder, whether it's ITP or uh, Glanzmann's. And uh, maybe that lower instance of the von Willebrand's is along the, uh, um, uh, the, the question asked uh, earlier that maybe we're over-diagnosing it now, though you could argue that uh, maybe it's when we talk about some of these cases of von Willebrand's or just von Willebrand factor deficiency related to blood type O, they could still possibly, they could still possibly be playing a role possibly in their bleeding, uh, but it may not uh, be the only role uh, in that uh, sense, that the bleeding, just like thrombosis, could be, you know, multifactorial. And in a study done uh, through uh, uh, Joan Gill and uh, Bob Montgomery's group, uh, Bevan, uh, showed uh, that uh, in an inpatient uh, service of uh, adolescents hospitalized uh, with, um, with uh, menorrhagia um, uh, presenting acutely, um, about uh, a tenth, a little bit more, had uh, were thrombocytopenic, and of those, uh, that included ITP and uh, chemotherapy-induced. Uh, and then a study from Turkey uh, in the early 2000s uh, also showed a similar uh, prevalence uh, in that, um, uh, in that uh, regard. So certainly uh, someone could present, it's a no-brainer if they have uh, ITP uh, with uh, heavy menstrual uh, bleeding. 
And uh, certainly, as uh, Jennifer pointed out, giving around-the-clock IV estrogen is an option in terms of uh, Premarin, uh, 25 milligrams, uh, uh, Q6 or 50 uh, uh, Q, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, giving, the, giving 50 maybe uh, Q12, as well as starting them on, um, you know, ethanol uh, estradiol, maybe at 15 micrograms. Uh, is clearly an option, and obviously uh, this is very rudimentary what we could do hematologically. You're well aware of our options acutely. Many of you encounter this, that if they're bleeding, bleeding briskly, you know, you would also uh, give IVIG. Uh, there may be some uh, benefit within, you know, 24 hours, and uh, certainly if they're uh, bleeding uh, particularly uh, uh, rapidly, uh, there may be still some benefit for platelets, uh, that uh, there may be some uh, bump, uh, some increment in the uh, platelet uh, count uh, when you transfuse those platelets, as uh, was reported, um, again, about 20 years ago by the Beth Israel group, uh, Margot Kisker, where they showed that roughly a third of patients with ITP uh, had a sizable uh, rise uh, in their uh, platelet count. And um, uh, rituximab, again, is uh, an option that's not going to work immediately, but in some cases it has uh, uh, been reported to raise the platelet count within 24 hours. Maybe it's an IVIG type effect that it has. Uh, data is still accruing in terms of using uh, the new thrombomimetic agents, obviously for subacute bleeding that would be appropriate. Uh, and plate, romaplastin and otropobag are not going to immediately work, uh, you know, within a few days, though. Uh, romiplastin, which I'll talk a bit in the context of chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia, uh, you know, may have, um, you know, a role, uh, you know, in, in, that, uh, in that regard. And then, obviously, we know that splenectomy still remains the, you know, uh, long-term best uh, option in managing these patients. But again, uh, patient preference often uh, has uh, moved uh, these other, uh, you know, options, um, you know, uh, to be tried first before splenectomy when the patient, uh, you know, is deferring uh, the long-term risk of uh, being asplenic uh, in that uh, sense that uh, there's clearly these other options. And my pediatric colleagues uh, know well often if they have associated acquired autoimmune hemolytic anemia uh, uh, together with ITP, CELSEP seems to, you know, have a very, um, you know, appropriate role in that type of uh, situation. And then when you have the patient who's not thrombocytopenic but they have platelet dysfunction, uh, certainly, again, IV, uh, you know, estrogen works, uh, as uh, we've just uh, mentioned, uh, for the acute uh, setting. Uh, Minucci years ago also published this for uh, uremic uh, bleeding also. Um, so that is an option. And for subacute bleeding, um, I don't know how often uh, Andy and Jennifer have done this, but uh, the marina is an option. Uh, the only issue is it may be technically difficult to do in a, an acute setting like this, um, especially in a nulliparous patient, but if they're uh, bleeding uh, right at that moment, it's probably technically, uh, um, you know, uh, possible to uh, insert it uh, in that uh, regard. And again, for subacute issues, uh, there have been reports of uh, patients with conditions like Glanzman's uh, benefiting from endometrial ablation, but obviously uh, that would have to be beyond their child-bearing uh, uh, year or so. That's not always an option because these Glanzman's uh, patients uh, often will start, you know, bleeding, um, you know, right at the time of uh, menarche. So it's a little bit misleading to, you know, uh, play uh, that, uh, you know, to play that option up uh, in that uh, regard. And obviously, uh, the tool set that we can use uh, as a hematologist includes, uh, obviously, the same agents we use for uh, VWF-related uh, uh, bleeding. And in terms of uh, DDV, it's very interesting. Desmopressin has not uh, been uh, extensively studied in uh, thrombocytopathic-related uh, bleeding. But um, uh, again, a number of years ago, um, Donna Dima Kelly, when she was uh, in Denver with Bill Hathaway, uh, 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 described a series of patients uh, who had uh, thrombocytopathic-related uh, bleeding, uh, where they were administered DDAVP, and the suggestion, the I, the the uh, thought is theoretically that you're, you know, increasing uh, maybe above uh, normal levels, supernormal levels, VWF, that is uh, favoring, you know, platelet uh, aggregation uh, in that sense. In, in our uh, recently published uh, multi-center study with uh, Claire Phillip and uh, Roshni, uh, 
and Andy James, uh, we had also shown that uh, women who have uh, platelet function uh, uh, disorder-related menorrhagia uh, uh, can benefit from intranasal DDAVP, not as, uh, uh, not as uh, uh, great as a degree as they would with antifibrinolytic therapy. And again, preferably this would be transamic acid because it is about four to five times more potent than epsilon aminocoproic acid, uh, which obviously was not, a, uh, it was not in the conversation uh, here in the United States five years ago because it wasn't available for quite a long period of time. But now, as it's already been mentioned, uh, the oral form is available uh, as a semi-sustained release form, uh, which is not given uh, QID but uh, TID. Uh, Lystata, that's uh, at 650 milligram uh, pill, uh, two pills, uh, TID uh, given for uh, five days. Uh, but an option is if someone's hospitalized and they're acutely bleeding, um, as uh, Jennifer has shown, uh, you can give the tranexamic acid uh, intravenously uh, 10, uh, you know, uh, mg per uh, keg uh, every eight hours uh, in that um, uh, scenario. Um, and uh, again, um, it could be an option uh, when you have such a patient, um, you know, uh, and I have heard of cases of uh, Glansman's and, and, uh, and uh, Bernard Souillet's of, uh, you know, benefiting from, uh, you know, just uh, immediately at the start of their period going on uh, Lystata. Um, as you know, this was uh, uh, just approved uh, um, about a year ago, and uh, when it was approved, um, there was, um, uh, actually about a year and a half ago, there was um, uh, concerns that uh, because this, the uh, indication was the study was uh, in uh, patients who are 18 uh, years or older, that uh, it may not necessarily be safe in adolescents. It's just that uh, the company did not study it in that uh, age group. The FDA did not say that it cannot be used. It's just that uh, th this is a ripe time to study it in terms of its pharmacokinetics in terms of uh, whether perhaps uh, the, you know, uh, 1.3 uh, gram uh, dose is uh, necessary or should it be a lower dose, the one pill, 650. And I know some of the colleagues in this audience are, uh, are studying it at this time. And we look forward to uh, seeing those results in the adolescent uh, population. Um, but uh, that's still an unclear issue in someone who's of the adolescent age is the pharmacokinetics that different that uh, you have to use a lower dose or perhaps uh, you have to use a higher dose. Um, and I think uh, at this point you often are basing it on their uh, weight. Uh, so if they're extremely thin and you're, there's concerns they may be susceptible to any side effects like cramping uh, from the medication, perhaps starting at 650 uh, TID. But again, this is still technically uh, uh, an area of, uh, you know, further uh, research uh, is uh, needed to, you know, sort that out. And I'm aware of several colleagues carrying out uh, such uh, studies. So we look forward, uh, you know, to those results um, in that uh, regard. And in general, as you know, if you have uh, um, a inherited thrombocytopathic disorder, we're not excited to give platelets because they can get al become alloimmunized. So uh, back to what I said earlier at the beginning, that's maybe one of the few instances where you would, uh, you know, think about using uh, recombinant 7A. And I know uh, Roshni has used it in, you know, several instances of their Glansman's uh, patients uh, in that regard. Now, shifting gears finally to uh, the main title of this talk in terms of uh, chemotherapy induced, again, the theme is about the same. We have both gynecologic and hemos uh, hemostatic uh, options. The gynecologic options include what uh, we've already, you know, discussed in terms of using uh, IV estrogen or ethanol estradiol, um, or sometimes you could use standard OC, maybe three pills for three days, two for two days, and then one is a taper. Um, so there's various uh, ways to do it. Um, if for whatever reason um, estrogen is not an option, Jennifer had also mentioned norethstradone uh, is certainly an option uh, too. And someone who's beyond childbearing age for acute uh, menorrhagia is in our case uh, report by my colleague John Phelan. Um, uterine artery embolization is an option. Endometrial is more for long-term management. Again, if they're beyond you know, childbearing uh, in that uh, uh, regard.
In terms of specifically studying uh, the use of hormonal therapy, there was uh, an interesting report uh, a number of years ago that uh, looked at patients who had uh, uh, chemotherapy-induced uh, um, uh, thrombocytopenia with uh, heavy menstrual bleeding, and uh, then they looked uh, subsequently to see if they still had heavy menstrual bleeding after they received either progesterone or uh, Lupron. Um, uh, and you can see there was a reduction, but if you also look at the third bullet, uh, there also was a reduction if nothing was uh, even done, suggesting that uh, the bleeding can be intermittent. So it's not entirely clear, uh, you know, if um, there's clearly one superior treatment, uh, but uh, certainly in a uh, person uh, outside of the setting of, you know, breast cancer uh, treatment, um, if uh, they're receiving dose-intensive uh, therapy, it's worth having them on uh, oral contraceptive, uh, you know, prophylactically. But if they then subsequently had major bleeding, some other options could include, uh, you know, either progesterone or uh, Lupron uh, in that uh, regard in terms of, uh, in terms of hormonal therapy. Um, but uh, certainly when they start bleeding, uh, or even prophylactically, one could consider some of the, hem the hemostatic measures, such as antifibrinolytic therapies I discussed. Um, there's a little typo there, 10,000, there's twice. But uh, as you know, the standard usually is to transfuse the flow, there are 10,000, and they're, you know, obviously if they're briskly bleeding, you don't wait until the, the platelet uh, reaches, you know, 10,000. Uh, but uh, certainly, um, again, as uh, we mentioned in uh, these other settings, um, uh, one should not hesitate to use uh, tranexamic acid if they're an inpatient uh, receiving dose-intensive treatment like induction chemotherapy. Um, it would be appropriate to, uh, you know, give 10 mg uh, per keg of, uh, you know, tranexamic acid uh, every eight hours in that setting. Or conceivably, uh, Lysteta, the sustained form, as I discussed, though, uh, often in uh, patient formularies in hospitals don't keep it on their formulary, but that still is an option. Or again, uh, Amicar, but if you had to choose, probably tranexamic uh, acid. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to use 7A. Maybe we're treating ourselves, but if they have uh, thrombocytopenic, uh, uh, chemotherapy induced thrombocytopenic uh, related uh, heavy menstrual bleeding, that doesn't uh, really seem to uh, you know, help uh, as much. And um, we do know uh, in the past that, uh, um, in terms of, you know, ideally, if we, we could, you know, uh, you know, raise their platelet count in terms of simulating uh, their megakaryocytes, that would be the best way to go. That, of, co that of course, takes time to do, uh, but uh, that is promising in terms of the new thrombomimetic agents that I'll talk about. But before uh, romoplastin and uh, trompobag became available, uh, there was interleukin-11. And curiously, uh, Dr. Ragney has uh, shown that uh, that actually does have uh, perhaps uh, some role also in von Willebrand, so stay tuned because it also raises VWF levels. So it takes about four days to really, you know, start to see that, you know, uh, go up. But what's interesting is it may have an effect in uh, favoring and uh, stopping menstrual bleeding apart from uh, affecting VWF levels. So there may be a local uterine mechanism uh, that is uh, in play with uh, IL-11. But it's usually not a very good option in this uh, setting uh, because uh, as far as raising the platelet counts, it's not going to work that fast. And the benefit-risk ratio is quite uh, narrow in that sense. What's really promising is uh, the more specific thrombomimetic agents uh, that uh, many of you in this audience have prescribed. And before I finish, uh, you know, on those options, I just want to mention, of course, some uh, basic concepts that many of you know, of course, I'm kind of, again, preaching to the choir here, that uh, when you are transfusing uh, platelets, uh, certainly when they're febrile, there seems to be, you know, decreased survival of uh, the platelets, or if there's ongoing bleeding, it's often a, you know, uh, catch-22. And just last year, there was a uh, well-conducted study through the Transfusion uh, Hemostasis Network led by uh, Dr. Slichter that uh, did show that uh, you can't really get by with the lowest dose possible of uh, platelets uh, in that sense. And uh, there is a plenary paper at this uh, meeting of uh, platelets being produced by a megakaryocyte cell line that seems uh, very uh, uh, promising uh, to increase the yield of platelets, so stay tuned to that. But really, um, the biggest promise in trying to manage chemotherapy-induced uh, thrombocytopenia uh, in 2011 and beyond is really with the thrombomimetic agents. And now there's been slowly a, uh, a uh, 
a, sudden, a, a slow appearance of, uh, of uh, observations of using these agents, including uh, this one recently um, uh, this year, where a patient uh, uh, who had mantle cell lymphoma was also a Jehovah Witness patient and uh, was um, managed with a dose of uh, romaplastin at this point where the arrow is red. And uh, you can see how the platelet count uh, um, did uh, respond. Uh, and this was after they received very intensive therapy for mantle cell, the hyper CVAD regimen that is quite myelosuppressive. And then ultimately, apparently they did have a component of ITP and they had uh, splenectomy. Uh, but again, one case doesn't, uh, um, you know, uh, mean a lot in that sense. And really uh, what's important is to, you know, have case series and ideally randomized studies. And that is slowly coming out there in the literature. Uh, last year at the American Society of Hematology, uh, Dr. Vadhan Raj from uh, the MD Anderson, uh, did uh, uh, publish, did present a study of using uh, romoplastum, romoplastum um, for chemotherapy induced rhombocytopenia. And you can see that there was, uh, you know, an improvement with pre and post dosing in terms of these various uh, markers uh, that they looked at uh, here uh, in that uh, regard. So that's somewhat uh, promising. Obviously, it's a very uh, expensive drug, and one will also need to do as part of uh, further studies cost analysis vis-a-vis uh, -vis platelet transfusions, but obviously there's also the risk of aluminization. If this is saving, uh, you know, future aluminization, which is an issue, this will be a very good thing. And um, uh, at our uh, meeting, uh, uh, at this present meeting, there are a number of uh, studies uh, that will be presented of uh, using aromaplastin, not as much using a tropa bag. There's one study that I'll mention in the next, uh, in, towards the end. But my colleague Jerry Soff at Sloan Kettering uh, it will be presenting, uh, his uh, fellow will be presenting uh, this study uh, where they used uh, weekly uh, romoplastum. Uh, and these were people who really had severe uh, uh, therapy-induced thrombocytopenia, and yet because of their underlying malignancy, they needed further treatment. And these were people who up to uh, 10 weeks uh, remained uh, uh, thrombocytopenic below 50,000. Uh, and, uh, and these were people that they then uh, felt were appropriate to be treated with uh, romiplastum uh, using the sub-Q dosing that it's not as high as you could go in the package insert to uh, 10 mics per keg, but uh, they did escalate by 1 mics per keg to a maximum of 4 mics per keg. I'm not sure why they use that as the upper limit in that regard. And uh, in this um, uh, study, again, this uh, is that this will be presented at this uh, meeting. Um, in all patients, uh, they did have a response above 100,000. You could argue, you know, you don't have to be greedy. Uh, maybe even 75 would be adequate to maybe, uh, uh, you know, then receive full dose. But ideally, to receive full dose treatment, you typically, for better or for worse, again, this is more anecdotal based, want to see the playlist count of, you know, at least 100,000. And uh, they were able to achieve that. And uh, then they continued the uh, romoplastin prophylactically and uh, enabled these patients to receive their chemotherapy on uh, schedule. And most of these patients had uh, solid uh, tumors, one lymphoma patient. And uh, it's pretty impressive. I mean, you can see that uh, the duration of thrombocytopenia was, you know, for many, many weeks. Uh, the, the lowest was for five weeks. They had playlists below. Uh, 50,000, I mean below 100,000, and they started their platelets, you know, at this range. And again, when your platelets are in that range of 58,000 uh, or 53,000, 48,000, uh, typically one would not give, you know, treatment or have to make a dose reduction if you're using dose-intensive uh, treatment, perhaps using a, an ice reg a hyper CVAD for, hot, for uh, mantle cells I mentioned earlier, or uh, made for sarcoma, uh, those uh, platelet counts are too low to really permit, you know, full dosing. Uh, or, uh, it can become very problematic. So this is a very promising uh, observation, and I think um, you know uh, uh, you know deserves further study. Whether the company will decide to go in that direction eventually for an indication, I'm not sure. It would probably help in terms of insurance issues, uh, but uh, you know it, it may have clearly a role. And also at this meeting, uh, as you could imagine, another uh, setting of, uh, of severe uh, thrombocytopenic, uh, of severe chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia would be with hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Uh, 
And uh, there's a number of uh, abstracts at this uh, meeting. The first two are using uh, romaplastum. And again, these were people who were extremely thrombocytopenic as expected because of a very dose-intensive uh, regimen, essentially myeloablative therapy. And uh, there seemed to be a benefit in that situation. My dear colleague Jane Liesveld in my sister institution is in the is in the uh, pro, is in the phase uh, is um, in the process of uh, completing a uh, study using uh, Otropabag, and that's the only study, to my knowledge, at this meeting that uh, uh, is being presented of using this oral agent uh, in um, chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia setting. And um, uh, again, this is just a dose escalation study. Uh, the response will be looked at uh, in the next uh, six months or so, so stay tuned. Um, again, one concern with these agents perhaps is, you know, could they perhaps uh, uh, induce fibrosis? Could they perhaps uh, induce uh, uh, thrombotic events? Though we are now discovering with the ITP story that uh, patients with de novo ITP, even before being treated with thrombomimetic agents, have a slightly higher than baseline risk of uh, developing thrombotic events eventually. So it's not entirely clear where these agents uh, truly induce a thrombotic event, though in this uh, dose escalation study there was one case of, um, of a pulmonary uh, embolus. So stay tuned about that. But um, I do think there will eventually be a role uh, for these agents, and they will probably be the most important tool uh, to uh, use, um, you know, in, uh, in this uh, type of uh, setting. And again, uh, we kind of are beating a dead horse here in terms of what we can do uh, gynecologically. Obviously, uh, there is still the mainstay of uh, IV uh, estrogens, and as uh, Jennifer pointed out, less of a concern in terms of thrombosis uh, if um, you know it's just for a short course. Though I still worry because we are an epidemic of obesity, and uh, the uh, Dutch group has uh, published uh, uh, very uh, convincingly that uh, um, outside of the acute setting, uh, when oral contraceptives are being prescribed uh, in a morbidly obese patient, there's clearly a synergistic effect uh, for uh, thrombotic events. And uh, we may be reaching a point when we you know, should be refusing to prescribe an oral contraceptive in someone morbidly obese as, uh, we're, as we refuse to if they're you know, actively uh, smoking um, in that you know, regard. Um, but um, uh, certainly, uh, I've also uh, been talking about uh, using, you know, antifibrinolytic therapy, and I think uh, because we now have the sustained uh, release form of, you know, uh, transamic acid lysata, it's really here to stay, and that, uh, you know, should be part of, uh, you know, our management uh, in these uh, people. And again, in very, very, very select cases, you could use 7A. I'm talking primarily for. Um, Glansman's and uh, for Bernard Soulier. And I do think uh, with uh, further study, we'll see a role for the thrombomimetic agents, but you know, I, I um, you know, don't want to be naive about this. They're obviously very costly, and our institutions will be requiring, understandably, you know, more data and some cost effectiveness vis-a-vis -vis the use of platelet you know, transfusions, uh, which you know, will hopefully show that you know, there clearly is a role you know, for such an agent when someone is uh, undergoing dose-intensive chemotherapy. Thank you. Uh, this talk is open for questions. Please come to the microphone and identify yourself and your institution. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, Lynn Boshkov from Oregon Health and Science uh, in, uh, in Portland. I treat a lot of Jehovah's Witness patients, some um, with malignancy. And I totally agree with everything you uh, have said. They do not accept platelet transfusion. Many accept cryoprecipitate. And I've actually found um, cryo, uh, usually a five pool for platelet counts under 10 with uh, hemorrhagic manifestations. A series of anecdotes does not data make. Cryo with, without a cryo precipitate when, they're, when they have when what type of bleeding? When they're thrombocytopenic oh. uh, and have bleeding manifestations oh. in many, many cases, the petechiae go away and bleeding stops. Uh, I have had them severely thrombocytopenic platelet counts under 10 for a month at a time sometimes, and the cryo um, has been very effective. As I said, a series of anecdotes does not they uh, make. On what basis do you think? Wanted that's to share that. 
I don't know. I mean, cryo is full of von Willys, which helps platelets stick down. They aggregate with fibrinogen. I tell myself this story. Um, you know, Pat Ford uh, first used this in Jehovah's Witness patients, and it's in a published uh, case report of hers. But I do routinely put them on tranexamic acid. Uh, I do give them cryo, and I do give them uh, end plate. So. Thank you. Peter, thanks for your talk. I just had a quick question. What's your institution's experience with using something prophylactic, like a GnRH analog in the patient who's presenting with thrombocytopenia, either related to you know anything from aplastic anemia to um, thr thrombocytopenia induced by chemotherapy? Um, do you, are some of your gynecologists routinely offering um, courses of GnRH analogs where they downregulate periods? In addition to some of the other therapies that you've mentioned, right? As I mentioned, you know that has been studied, um, you know, in a few instances. And um, at our own institution, they would, you know, offer, um, you know, oral, you know, a th you know, just being on a uh, combined OC um, is the first step. Is are you starting to use GnH? Or so H or? we we actually use them pretty frequently. We're consulted by our hematology oncology colleagues for prophylactic administration. Um, you know, certainly the one thing that we have to keep in mind is that the first time they um, receive the very first injection, they will have a flare period about two to three weeks after the initial injection. And then as long as the injection is given consistently during the course of the anticipated therapy, they'll be downregulated and really shouldn't have any menstrual-related bleeding or just spotting that is quite easy to control or may not need any additional therapies. And so it can be given once a month or once every three months, and then certainly if it's needed beyond six months, we can provide a progestin-only add-back. So you, you have used this in uh, over using a, a, a combined OC? You know, um, not everybody has had the same um, sort of level of comfort, I think, with combined OC use in the setting of cancer because it's considered, you know, a thrombotic condition. And so, um, you know, it may be different at your institution and at other institutions, but we've tried to use agents that then don't add that additional concern. Um, and that's certainly one effective option that doesn't add that thrombotic risk. But you still want to use a GnRH in, say, in a breast cancer patient, though, right? Because theoretically... Um, well, theoretically, I mean, there's that risk of upregulation of hormones initially, but then you anticipate to downregulate things after that. Um, but it doesn't um, really affect your estrogen or your progesterone receptors. So you have that. used it in and breast so cancer. So you can. So okay. you can in that regard. And it doesn't, it, it's a nice option because it doesn't increase the thrombotic risk above and beyond what they're already dealing with. You have a question way in the back? Uh, Evan? No, I, yeah. Just as a follow-up to that, I, I'm Sanjay oh, okay. from uh, Pediatric okay. Hematology as well. I, having worked with Jennifer before in a different institution, we have started using GNRH analogs in our pediatric patients with soft, you know, soft tissue tumors or whatever that may be, and it works beautifully. Let me tell you, their periods stop, and they don't have many problems after that. So you'd have to do all of this and just, you know, you kind of freeze their ovaries, for lack of a better word, is what we call it. So it works, right? Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, Evelyn Lockhart from Duke. I had a question and observation. Uh, my question was regarding the case that you had discussed initially. Had that patient been checked for alloimmunization to platelet-specific antigens such as PLA1? Uh, yes, I believe okay. she did. Okay, and that was. She was more they just because uh, it happened so early on in her yeah. course, you know, and uh, because it, it, by day 18, um, you know, she became thrombocytopenic. Okay. Uh, the observation I wanted to share is uh, practice that we do at Duke and I believe at other institutions as well is uh, for patients who are thrombocytopenic, particularly chemotherapy induced thrombocytopenia and are having refractory, uh, refractoriness to platelet transfusions, we will recommend transfusing red cells as well for these patients and trying to keep their hematocrit around 30 just because of 
the challenges that you'll have with the rheology of blood flow and trying to make sure that the platelets are as marginalized to the vessel wall as possible. Uh, not, not the strongest evidence for that, but when your back is up against the wall with these patients, hopefully every bit counts. No, that's a great point, and uh, it's an observation Aaron Marcus showed years ago that you need the red cells to help scaffold the platelets at the site of, you know, the clot formation. And uh, we often, you know, get this very uh, angry response from our surgical colleagues when we're asked to see somebody who's bleeding out, usually because of silk deficiency, in other words, not enough sutures postoperatively, and their crit's 22%, and I'm telling them, you know, give red cells. Do I know how to do that? I'm asking, you know, what about all that other stuff, 7A, whatever. Give red cells, and it's for that reason. We also know that, you know, ever since the advent of using the ESAs in the dialysis population, there's far less, you know, uh, bleeding with these patients. Um, you know, probably, you know, for that very fundamental reason as you bring up. So you're absolutely right, um, you know, uh, that it's important to, you know, uh, make sure you know, you're also transfusing. Though obviously in the last decade, uh, you know, transfusion practices have become, you know, more conservative in a good way, um, you know, and uh, having, a, you know, uh, the transfusion trigger, uh, you know, being lower, but still in this regard, when they're actually bleeding, you know, it's, it makes sense. It's going to exactly. help hemostasis. It's, it's, a, it's a different indication, and that's something that we, we try and teach our hemato hematology residents and fellows there, that usually when you're talking red cell indications, you're talking symptomatic anemia. You would want to be on the more restrictive side for that generally, but in this case, the indication particularly for these bleeding refractory patients is uh, hemostasis. So, thank you. We have one more question in the back, and then Maggie. Okay. Hey, hey Pete. I'm John Bernstein, Las Vegas. One of our compatriots, Neil Blumberg, I think had an article about two to three years ago about AML and platelet transfusions. And it may have been a, you know, the fact that the worst patients, uh, the ones that were more likely to die, needed more platelets or not, but the, the fact that he pointed out was the more transfusions you gave, less chance you had of curing your AML, was what the, I guess, the basis right. of the article. So Neil's a dear colleague of mine, but I think others would say it hasn't, you know, that um, still hasn't been well demonstrated whether there's really a bad immunosuppressive effect. So one know, of the, the questions playlist, would be is whether or not um, there, someone like ECOG or anyone else is looking at the possibility of doing a comparison trial using the um, thrombomimetics um, to see that and to prove one way or the other. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not aware of that, but I think, you know. Well, I don't know. if it, I was asking, basically, if you knew of any, but nothing as of yet. Uh, no, not at this. Uh, I'm unaware. Maggie? Great talk. I thank you for uh, mentioning IL-11. And just to set the record straight, we just published a study using IL-11 in menorrhagia. And it turns out if you do measure day two, three, and four, not only do you get clinical effect, but you also see an increase in VWF beginning at day two. It takes 24 hours to start uh, getting some effect on VWF mRNA and upregulating. But peak was at day four, right? That right. You well, had the... that was the day we measured in the first study. But you actually start in clinically with patients who have menorrhagia seeing it as soon as day two. So that study, which is in thrombosis hemostasis, it's very interesting because it, it clearly these were the worst of the worst, women with VWD-related menorrhagia. Uh, who had failed or were intolerant of uh, prior hormonal or hemostatic therapy. And you had set up for nine patients, seven were valuable. And uh, in all cases, uh, there was a statistically significant uh, P less than uh, 0 0.01 uh, reduction in all three measures of uh, menstrual flow that they looked at, the pictorial chart score, as well as looking at uh, cycle severity, as well as looking at the duration of bleeding. Uh, so for example, the score, the pictorial chart score, um, was reduced by 50% and 71%, uh, and the same with the cycle severity. And uh, the duration of bleeding was uh, reduced by two and a half days. So uh, it's very, you know, uh, promising. It's a very small sample size. It wasn't done, you know, with a control group. So for all those various reasons, we have our fingers crossed that a randomized study will be uh, supported uh, to look at uh, IL-11 
uh, versus transamic acid based on the prior CDC multi-center study uh, that um, we did with transamic acid, uh, we show less of a reduction, um, you know, um, in terms of, but our, the reduction that we showed was still within the range of your confidence intervals of what you showed. So because of that, um, it makes sense to compare the two, you know, head to head. So uh, I have my fingers crossed about that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter.